Matthew chapter 25, and we're going to be in verse 14. We're going to read all the way through verse 30, but I'm going to take it just a chunk at a time. So we're going to start with just Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 and 15. And this is what Matthew says here. And Jesus is uh, speaking here, and he's teaching about the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. And this is the rulership of God. This would be his domain, the realm over which heaven presides. And so he, he talks about it this way, saying, The kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of a man going on a long trip. He called together his servants and entrusted his money to them while he was gone. His money to his servants while he was gone on a trip. Verse 15. He gave five bags of silver to one, two bags of silver to another, and one bag of silver to the last, dividing it in proportion to their abilities, and then he left on his trip. There's a few things I want us to see here as we get started with just sort of laying the foundation of the story And the first here is that Jesus is saying this story actually illustrates to us how God rules and reigns. It's it's one example of the way that God rules and reigns. And so he actually, in Matthew 25, gives several examples of what it means uh, to, to understand the kingdom of heaven. This is just one of those examples. So it doesn't explain everything about the kingdom of God, but it does give us an insight into some of the things of the kingdom of God. So as we look at this, first of all, it's not exhaustive, but it is going to tell us a little bit about how God rules and reigns and how he calls us into his rule and reign, calls us into his kingdom. He says it's, uh, it's like, a, guy, it's like a, a man who actually goes on a long trip. He calls together his servants. He entrusts his money to them while he was gone, and he gives, he gives each of them, he gives, uh, he's got three servants, he gives each of them different amounts. Did you notice that? One, he gives five. And to the the other he gives two, and then to one he gives one. He gives each of them according to their ability. Did you see that? It's it's in verse 15. He says, dividing his assets up in proportion to their abilities. And then he leaves on their trip. The first thing I want us to see is that the kingdom of heaven is like this. And we understand that this master to be God and these servants to be like ourselves. And we understand that God has given to each of us varying gifts Varying responsibilities, each of us according to our abilities. Now, for me, what I think that means, and and there's a few things we can we can talk about, and of course I'd love for you to talk about this more and hash this out some more in community with some other people. But what this, at least on the surface, means is that God gives each of us different abilities, and we have different gifts that match our abilities. So whatever we have was given to us by God, its abilities, resources, whatever. And those are actually meant to coincide with the ability to do something. They actually have intention. They have purpose when God gives you what you have. Whether that's a skill set or ability or talents, or that could be actual resources like money or a house or something else. It could be uh, time that you've you've come into. Uh, It could be any number of things that we have been given, we have been entrusted with. And I want us to see that those things that are given to us are given with purpose each according to our ability, and and it begs the question, ability to do what? And that's what I think we need to acknowledge is, is, first of all, that everything we have is a gift from God. He gave the master to his servants his money. Whatever they have, they were actually only stewarding whatever was his in the first place. You see that? That's the first thing we have to acknowledge. <clears throat> and then I think we have to acknowledge that everything we do have is tied to an objective, tied to our abilities. And he expects us, the master expects his servants, to use what gifts have been given in line with, with what abilities they have. So, as I mentioned before, the gifts of time, money, resources, spiritual gifts, personality type and wiring, skill sets, education, a measure of influence, all this is given to you to be able to do something with that. And then we would say, to do what? Able, ability, to do what? And that, I think, is a great question. It is a question you should be asking yourself. It's a question you should be asking a trusted mentor. It's a question you should be asking people that you're in community with. It's something you should be hashing out as you are in community with either a mentor or even a counselor or something like that. You should be actually asking what it is God would like for you to do with your life, with your time, with your money, with all the things that are yours, if I can put it that way. They're yours to steward. We need to be asking what it is God wants from us. So I I just thought of a a few questions right off the bat for me as I was thinking about this. One question would be, what do I have by way of gifts that God can use? 
Uh, last night, our family was in, in the living room just asking questions. Each of the kids wanted to know what their spiritual gifts were. I don't even know how that came up. But someone asked, what are my spiritual gifts? And then we uh, started a- answering all those questions. What are your spiritual gifts, Dad? What are Mom's spiritual gifts? And so we started talking about those things. And uh, it takes a little while to figure some of that out. But I do think that we, in, in our homes and in our workplaces where, where we have believers and friends, and even uh, with, with our church community, and especially with our church community, should be asking those kinds of questions. Wait a second. What do I have? If I've been given gifts, it's not really important whether I've been given five or two or one, but just what gifts do I have? And, and then I think taking an inventory like that would be good. And then what do these things enable me to do? What do these enable me to do? And then another one is what opportunities are presenting themselves to me regularly? What opportunities are presenting themselves? Here's another one that I wrote. It's for me. But what am I afraid to do but feel like I'm supposed to do? Someone said this to me. I think it was a friend. But we're, we're, the, the intersection of, of sort of fear or just kind of anxiety maybe and excitement are sometimes... A, uh, an indication of sort of where God might be leading you. So what, what does that look like for you? What, what are God's objectives in the world? So we got all the things I can do, you know, just my gifts and skill sets, then all the things and opportunities that might be presenting themselves, and then lining it up with all the things that God's at work doing in the world that I can observe, and where those sort of collide right in the middle, there might be something of a secret to, to maybe what God might want you to do to advance his kingdom through the gifts he's given you with the opportunities that are right in front of you. You see that? You can do something like that. This is like a small seminar here on how to discover God's will. But I'm I'm encouraging you a little bit to really be intentional with some of this stuff. You're not just going to float through life and somehow happen upon accomplishing a lot for God's kingdom. (laughs) This doesn't happen that way. Uh, Organization and intentionality don't just happen by themselves. And, and I would suggest that we as good stewards are going to need to be like, at least like the first two of these guys that we're going to see in a second, need to be intentional with what God has given us to see how we can leverage that for the advance of his good news and for the spread of his kingdom. So I think for me, as I think about this, what are God's objectives? How can I use this? There was one more question that was just, it was for me, but I think it's, it really could apply to all of us. But, but what can I do to increase the number of people in whose hearts God now reigns? When I think of the kingdom of God, the domain over which God rules, I think of human hearts. And when I think of the spread of God's kingdom, I think of it jumping from my heart to someone else's and from theirs to someone else's. What would it look like for the kingdom of God in the hearts of men to be growing and ever expanding? You know, the universe is like that. Well, they say it is. I don't know much about it. But that the universe is sort of expanding at some rate. God is interested in expansion. What we learn about the master here is that he gives them his his assets, he divides it up according to their abilities, and he expects a return on that investment. So as we think about this, we, we need to think through what it would look like to leverage all I have for the advance of the kingdom of God. Now, uh, let's get to the next section here, verse 16. So we just read 14 and 15. We're still in Matthew 25, but verse 16 and 18 say this. The servant who received the five bags of silver began to invest the money and earned five more. Verse 17. The servant with two bags of silver also went to work and earned two more. But the servant who received the one bag of silver dug a hole in the ground and hid the master's money. Uh, We're going to get to the third servant in just a second, but I want you to see a couple of things about the the first two servants who actually made good on on investing what the master had left with them. The, The use of our gifts and resources, like I mentioned earlier, time, money, but also abilities or influence, Uh, to the people around us. All of those are meant to bring about an increase to God's kingdom. It's meant to bring a return on investment, if you will. And if you're using all the resources that God has given you to fortify your own life, you're not leveraging them for the kingdom of God. You may as well be digging a hole and putting everything into it. If everything you have by way of income just gets spent on you, you might as well be digging a hole and putting it all into it. It might be a hole as big as your house and cars and education and sports commitments. Whatever it is, if, if all we're doing, now I want you to hear some balance in what I'm saying because there is a little bit of nuance and balance here, but if, if, if all we're doing is actually just focusing on how to fortify ourselves and how to secure our investments and how to build wealth for ourselves, 
None of those on the surface are wrong, but if that's all we're doing, we're missing out on what God might want for us and how he might intend for us to use the assets and abilities he's given us, not just to further our own agenda, but also to further his and to see how those can be leveraged for his kingdom. Do you see that? There is some balance there. I do think we're going to need a place to live, folks. We're going to need a car to drive. We're going to need an education to get a job that's going to provide all those things. Don't get me wrong. I'm just saying don't misunderstand that as the primary uh, sort of agenda for your life. It is not. Okay, let me move on. What I think is that we can be doing both. I think we can be doing, uh, supporting our family, enjoying the things that God gives us, and also looking to be intentional with leveraging our time, our talents, our money, our influence, all for God's purposes in our life and around the world. So uh, I think for me, this really, it doesn't change things. It's not like I'm going to, well, I might stop doing something. I might sell something and give the proceeds. I, I might do stuff like that. And maybe God will lay it on some of your hearts to do things like that. But it really doesn't change anything except that it adds an element of intentionality to everything I'm doing. One of the problems I have when I exercise, and I don't like to exercise, and I, and I don't really do it unless a friend texts me in the morning saying, where were you this morning? I, I don't like doing that. And I've got some friends here actually at Anchor who really care for me. So I'll just, I'm going to use one. Rich, can I just use you as an example? Rich, uh, Rich actually got me nine sessions with his personal trainer for my birthday. Now, that's like giving someone mouthwash for their birthday. <laughs> that's like, here, you're out of shape. You should go see a personal trainer. Then I had another friend say, hey, come to me with my gym. So I go with, to the gym with him. Then I had another neighbor uh, actually say, you, you guys should come, your family come work out with our family most days of the week. Um, then it dawned on me, all my friends think I'm out of shape. <laughs> I don't like to work out. But... I do, but the problem I have when I exercise is that I always forget to engage my core. You wouldn't think that you need to engage your core when you're doing lunges, and I'm not going to do one because my knees will buckle. <clears throat> but you, would think, you wouldn't think you need to engage your core when you're doing lunges or overhead press or whatever else we're doing, whatever crazy things they got me doing. But you do. And, and, and I guess the, the real problem for me is that I'm, I'm not focused on, on engaging my core. And also when I'm doing workouts, like if I do anything overhead— uh, it, it's, you know, I, I need to focus on the actual muscles being engaged. I have to actually focus on like going down slowly and engaging those muscles, or it, I have to focus on whatever muscle group is being used. And actually, some of you are like, no, I just work out. It feels great. It's normal. I don't know what it's like for you guys when you work out, but for me, it takes intentionality. I actually have to focus on what's being exercised here. Uh, it's that same way. It's not going to change anything except that when we, when we actually bring our, our life and assets and resources and everything that God, God has given us into alignment with him, we're just being intentional with those things. And we're likely to get a lot more mileage out of all that God's given us if we would leverage them for his kingdom. Just be intentional is what I'm saying. And, and I, that example was really just to show that, that uh, that's an area for me that needs improvement. And, and so over the last 10, 15 years, as I've grown and tried to mature in Christ, I've learned that actually one of the things that lacks the most— is intentionality, just being focused and intentional. So I would encourage you to take some time to answer some of these questions and to wrestle with some of this in terms of what God has given you. Do that in community. Talk about that. Look at what opportunities might be in front of you. Look at what God might be doing in the world that calls out to you. And then begin with intentionality to set out uh, to, to accomplish those things, to leverage what God's given you to do that. Now, I, I think as I, as I think about intentionality, I think about, I, I thought just about, you know, exercise, obviously, but I think money is another area of intentionality. I think our time is another intentionality, a, a point of intentionality. Um, you know, an example would be tithing. This isn't a message on tithing, but tithing really, when you give 10% of your income to, to the church or to God, it's not as though you get an immediate benefit. We want that to be transactional. We want to say, hey, here's 10%, and now you're going to bless my business by 10% growth at the end of the year, right? And it doesn't work like that. The real benefit to uh, stewarding your money well and having some margin to give is that over, it, it, it's a benefit that comes to you over time because you've been intentional with how you manage your money. So it's a long-term benefit. It's not necessarily an immediate benefit, although sometimes God does sort of almost immediately bless us when we're faithful. But I want you to see that it's the intentionality of that 
that really drives uh, some of the benefits that you see long term. And it's the same with our time. We could pick on managing our money well, but man, we've got to think too about what it looks like to manage your time. Do you think about managing your time the way you think about managing your money? Uh, I think for some of us, the way we manage our time uh, is, is, well, it's non-existent, but it would be kind of the way we would imagine someone to not really be spending their money wisely. We just let whatever comes at us the week uh, determine our week. We just let whatever comes at us this day determine our day. And I know there's unexpected circumstances, but when it comes to our time, we're spending more than we have. And at the end of every week, we're exhausted because we didn't manage our time well. We're literally coming up short in the time account because we keep overcommitting ourselves to all the things God hasn't told us to do, to maybe get all the resources he hasn't uh, intended for us, or to spend our resources on things that he hasn't intended for us to spend them on. Nonetheless, we are coming up short, I think, in time and money. And, and in, in terms of our time, it's sort of paycheck to paycheck, same as it would be money. Any small catastrophe, we're, we're out of time. We're falling behind. And I think those are just those are easy examples to pick on. But I do think uh, it's the same concept here that intentionality can do for us when we think about it spiritual. Uh, when we think about it spiritually, when we think about dedicating our lives and our time to God, and what it would look like to be intentional in following Him. Now, th- I think those are easy to pick on, but influence is another thing. Uh, people who listen to us for advice or ask you for advice, th- those are all opportunities that God's given you. Are you stewarding those? What about the people that could easily be helped by your expertise or by your resources or just by your time with them? These are all opportunities. These are all uh, resources, talents that the Master has given us to use. And I want you to remember, too, that each of them were given an amount by the Master that he knew they could steward, each according to their ability. And so what we see is that the two of them take what they were given and they add to it. The first person was given five bags of silver and he invested it, made five more. The second person was given two bags of silver, went to work, and he earned two more. One of them invested, one went to work, they both invested, and either way they both leveraged what they had to double the investment for their master. And the last one didn't do anything with the master's money except hide it. Did you see that? What did he do? Well... It wasn't like he wasn't willing to work. He did dig a hole. I mean, I don't know how big the hole was. I don't know how deep it was. But he did work. He just wasn't willing to do the work that the master had asked him to do or that the master would like for him to do. He was willing to dig a hole but not willing to put the same energy into investing in what the master had given him to do. It's amazing how hard we will work to keep from having to obey God. It's amazing what things we will come up with, what reasons we can't, or what excuses we have for why we're doing what we're doing. It's amazing the work we will put into to go the other direction than what God's calling us to do. I want us to be humble and open as we think about this. I want us to keep reading, too. Matthew 25 The next section I want to look at is in verse 19 to 23. After a long time, their master returned from his trip and called them to give an account of how they had used his money. The servant to whom he had entrusted the five bags of silver came forward with five more and said, Master, you gave me five bags of silver to invest, and I've earned five more. The master was full of praise. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You've been faithful in handling this small amount, so now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. Verse 22, the servant who had received the two bags of silver came forward and said, Master, you gave me two bags of silver to invest, and I have earned two more. And the master said, well done, my good and faithful servant. You've been faithful in handling this small amount, and so now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. Again, we'll get to the third person, but for now it's worth stopping to see that the master really was equally pleased with both of the servants, with those first two servants, and it was not solely based on their accomplishment. They did each make 100% a return on their investment. So in that way it's the same, but in another way, one actually did uh, get five more talents when he was given five, and the other got two more talents when he was given five, and, and their abilities were not something that God actually judged or said, well done, good and faithful servant, because you had this particular ability 
charity or because I gave you these particular gifts or because you returned this amount on the investment. No. His commendation of them, if you'll stop and see it, if you'll go back and look, was not solely based on their accomplishment, but it was based on their faithfulness to him. Faithfulness is what God is looking at. Faithfulness is what God commends here to these good and faithful servants. Faithfulness, not fruitfulness, is the expectation of our master. He is not looking at you, hoping that you will help him evaluate whether you have been fruitful or not. That is not your job. He will determine that. He is interested in our faithfulness. And then he will determine the outcome or the fruitfulness of of all all the energy and assets we've invested He knows our abilities. He's given us gifts that are commensurate with our abilities. And he doesn't expect more than what he knows we can do with what he's given us. And the relief here for me as I think about the various gifts and then the various return on investment that these uh, servants had is that I don't have to measure myself against other people. I don't have to measure myself and you don't have to measure yourself against the gifts or abilities that other people have. Nor do you have to measure yourself against the fruitfulness or apparent fruitfulness. Meaning what it looks like on the surface against what anyone else is accomplishing. Or at least what it looks like on the surface in terms of what they're accomplishing. It resolves the tension of comparison and competition when we can focus on faithfulness to God with what he's given us. I think we've got to get there because too many times what's happening for us is that in a, in a culture like ours is that we are comparing ourselves to others and we only have what we can see on the surface to judge that by. So it, it's only what we can see in the first place, which is really only half the story if it's even half, because there's so much that God's doing that we can't see. So we're only using half the data And we're comparing ourselves with other servants that from the beginning of of our lives and whatever, it isn't even fair to do that because we've got different gifts according to different abilities with different expectations from us from our master. It wouldn't be fair to compare yourself with someone else given that their life may be intended by God to accomplish a different set of, of things. So we're just not going about this right if all we're doing is looking at the fruit and looking at accomplishments and looking at my performance, and looking at all all of my assets, and all of my property, and, and all of those kinds of possessions, we're not doing right if we're evaluating ourselves on the basis of those external things. So at the end of the day, we're stripped away. Everything really is stripped away in terms of how to measure whether I'm doing a good job or not. Everything gets stripped away because none of it really matters apparently, and all that gets left is just faithfulness. Are you doing what God's asking you to do with what God's given you, you being intentional with that, then all he's going to say is, well done, good and faithful servant. Not good and productive servant, but good and faithful. And the productivity and the achievement, the success, the possessions, all of that comes as needed in God's time, with God's purposes. So the relief again, I don't have to measure myself up against other people. They have different gifts than me. They have different abilities than me, and they will accomplish different things than me. But the master is not comparing his servants to each other. The master is overjoyed that each of them was faithful to use what God had given them. And all they did, I want you to see this too, all they did was put his money to work for him. That's all they did. It wasn't theirs, and nothing is ours. Everything is his. Nothing we do is for ourselves. Everything we do is as unto the Lord. There's a couple of times in the New Testament where Paul says, do everything as unto the Lord. Everything is meant as an offering to God. Everything is meant to be dedicated to God. Everything we do is as unto the Lord. Everything is for him. And the right kind of good and faithful servant will recognize that all I have is everything he's given to me. I owe 100% of it. To be truthful, 10% of our money and 10% of our time is way too little for church and and otherwise organizations to settle for. God is asking for 100% of you. That's way more than I think any of us were bargaining for. 
And we're just content to settle for small percentages of time and talent. And No, 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 no. All of you belongs to him. And he lets you keep some of it so that you can steward that and so that you can advance his kingdom through whatever means he gives you, with whatever education you get, with whatever job you get, with whatever neighborhood you live in. All of those things are on purpose. And he gives it to us for us to steward for his purpose. There's another relief here too, is that, that I mentioned it too though, but God doesn't evaluate me on the basis of my performance or by my accomplishments or, or by what I possess. I think that's good for us to be reminded as a church. God is not evaluating us in terms of whether we're good and faithful servants or just good and faithful in general on the basis of our performance, our accomplishments, or by what we possess. So that means that people who uh, perform better on, a, on one day or in one week or in one month or perform better in one quarter, they are not more loved by God that day or that quarter than they are on the day or the week or, or the month or the quarter that they did not perform well. But we're trapped in that. We are for sure. If we have a bad day as a parent, we feel like the whole day's lost. And we're tempted to think uh, that, that we evaluate ourselves and, and maybe even tempted to think that God might be evaluating us or for sure that our friends are evaluating us as to whether we're good and faithful on the basis of how well our kids behave or how well we looked while we were disciplining our kids or how well class went today or how, whether I passed that test or not or whatever. You could just go down the list of all the things we're using to evaluate ourselves and we are actually evaluating ourselves on the basis of performance how well I did, how well things went, or even achievement, how well things went, whether I got the promotion or not. If I don't get it, it means I'm a terrible person. It means I'm a worthless person. It means all the education I've received up to this point has been a waste. And, and I think that is a, a wrong and faulty way of viewing all that is happening in your life. God is not evaluating us on the basis of our possessions or achievements or on the basis of our performance. We can be free from all of that. I don't have to tie my emotions to a good Sunday or a bad Sunday as a pastor. I can't do that, actually. I don't, I don't want you to tie your emotions, meaning your whole week is thrown. You're rough with your family, rough with your roommates, simply because you've had a bad week. We can't allow uh, those type of circumstances to really dictate to us whether we have worth whether we have value, it can't dictate for us whether or not we evaluate ourselves to be uh, good with God or good with others. We have to release uh, our, our identity and release our evaluation of ourselves from those things and just remember faithfulness, loyalty, fidelity to God. That's what he's looking at. And in that case, it's kind of like me saying to my, one, of my, one of my kids, or like maybe you've heard someone say to one of their kids, listen, I don't care what you get on the test, did you do the best you could? Did we study? Did you put the time in? I love you no matter what you get on the test. That's kind of the same way. I mean, it's not exactly the same, but it's very similar. God's a good father. He knows we're going to make mistakes. He knows we're not perfect. He knows we're not going to always do what we're supposed to do, not always going to achieve all that we know we can achieve, perform all that we know that we can perform, uh, possess all that we know we can possess. He's, but he's not evaluating on the basis of that. It's faithfulness to him. And when that's the case, even when we've made a complete flop of things, when we come to him, we're received well by a loving father that says, let's work on this. Let's talk about this. It's all the same. It's relational. And so for us, I want us to see that that is a measure of relief. Now, this is not good news for someone who actually measures themselves by those standards. If I tell you, that God is not actually more pleased with you because you've become the CEO of a fast-growing company, uh, and that's what you've been spending your entire life's trajectory trying to reach, well, that's not good news, is it? It's actually a bit of a gut punch. It's actually a bit of a setback. Like, well, no, I thought all this meant something. And maybe in one way it does, but in this way, in terms of how God thinks of you and feels about you, uh, how he relates to you, it does not. It does not mean, uh, it, it does not have that kind of significance. And so I think actually it's not good news initially when we hear it that God isn't evaluating us on the basis of our performance because we've been trying really hard. But it is good news to those of us who will repent 
We can find freedom and we can find a path to, uh, to faithfulness by, by realizing the actual thing that God recognizes and rewards is faithfulness. You know, there's a lot of people in history, in church history, that are going to actually show up before God at the judgment and actually cite all of their productivity for the kingdom of God. They're going to say, but, but Lord, Lord, haven't we done all of these things? Didn't we cast out demons and didn't we do all these wonderful things? And what's he going to say to them? He's going to say to some of them, I never knew you. We never had a relationship. I wasn't evaluating you on the basis of your religious activity. Did you think that's what this was about? And so you, what we see at the end when we get a glimpse into the kingdom is a lot of religious people thinking that their obligation to God in order to be received well by God, to be in good standing with God, is to do as many religious things as possible to try to earn some right standing with God. And, and the good news of Jesus is, is actually completely the opposite, that there, there is nothing good like that that you can do. There is no achievement or performance or possession or, or, uh, or anything like that that would put you in any better standing with God it, other than what Christ has done for you. And then when you, when you sort of remove all of that, you're only left with what Christ has done and your faithfulness to Christ amid the ups and downs, the good and bad, the failures, mistakes, and sin and successes. All of that is something that God works out with you, but you remain faithful to him, never regarding yourself along the lines of your possessions or your, your achievement or, or your productivity. Always, always, always regarding yourself the way God regards you as his dearly loved child, as his good and faithful servant, striving to live up to what he has already called us. Man, that is so good, y'all. Maybe this, maybe this was for me, and it is for me. Honestly, this is a message that I can't quite articulate exactly how it's supposed to, or what it's supposed to mean for you, or how it's supposed to be applied to your life. I just know that God's been speaking to me through this. And really, you shouldn't just be walking away thinking that one sermon will answer all your questions. That's crazy. Uh, any sermon, uh, any sermon should be actually unpacked in community with friends and, and, and trusted believers so that you can actually come to a sense of what God might be saying to you. And I think for me anyway, when, I, when, when, I, when I'm moving into this idea here of just the accomplishment and, and the relational aspect of our devotion to God and our faithfulness to him, I think here's where we can misunderstand faithfulness. Faithfulness, when we think about faithfulness, don't you picture something that's just like slow and steady? Something that's just unchanging? It is the same. It is faithful. It's never going to change. I think because of that, um, we can sort of imagine that faithfulness is dull. It lacks productivity. It lacks achievement and accomplishment. It lacks possessions. Faithfulness is like a, you know, is, is, is like living in poverty. That's, that's faithfulness. And I want to tell you that it's not. That's actually another misunderstanding of what faithfulness to God looks like. Now, in one sense, faithfulness is being steady. It is being unchanging. It's, it's, it's faithfulness in, in terms of it being steady is in your loyalty to the king, your loyalty to Jesus. That never changes. We are faithful to him, loyal to him, devoted to him. That never changes. But a life that really is following God, that really is uh, seeking to, to be faithful to God, is anything but steady if you've ever really followed God for any length of time. It, it comes with some turbulence. A faithfulness to God who is ever expanding his kingdom into new territory is going to require that some of us actually take steps of faith to follow him. He's definitely got more courage than we do. I mean, we know he's got more love than we do. We know he's got more grace than we do. We know he's got more mercy than we do. But have you considered that he's got more vision for the future and more courage to go accomplish it than you do or than I do? Following God is anything but dull, anything but static. It is alive. It is vibrant. And he will call us to risk, call us to go all in for him. That's what these two faithful servants at the beginning did. They took the five they had and they had to risk it. They actually had to leverage it. And God's about that. When I think about this parable, one of the things that, that I guess we might be thinking is, is that God, I don't know, um, God might give us a dull or boring life, or maybe he'll take away all the fun things. Maybe I, I really love my job, and, and, I, and I love my things, and, and I'm afraid he'll call me to be a, a missionary somewhere, and I'll have to give up all those things. And 
live on the streets. I don't know what we imagine, but I do know that we imagine that God actually wants to take rather than imagining that he wants to give. This is a faulty perspective of God. We can find, and you can find, someone told me this, and again, this message really is just for me. Someone told me this several years ago. You can find all the adventure you're looking for in a life following God. You really can. The reason this parable works so well is because faithfulness involves risk, and apparently the master is not concerned with the risk that these two servants made when they invested his money and earned more. He doesn't say to them, whew, that was risky. You know what would happen if you lost all that? I mean, it's fortunate that they didn't. It's fortunate that they did make 100% return on their investment. But here's what I want you to see and why I think this parable really does work for the kingdom of God. Because there is no loss when you risk everything for the kingdom of God. There is no chance that you'll lose. The Bible says, just as an example, that his word, when it goes out, will never come back void. He will always accomplish what he intends to accomplish. Now, if we're measuring by just sort of situational or circumstances, if we're just measuring by external fruit or just what it looks like was accomplished when we had that conversation or helped that person or did this or went there and did that, then yeah, maybe it looks like nothing happened. But the truth of it is when we follow God in faithfulness, he always accomplishes what he sets out to accomplish. And we can just rest in that because we were faithful to him regardless of the outcome. That's good news. That's good news for us. And, and the, again, the reason this parable works well is because when we use the gifts and abilities that God gives us, we don't, use, we don't lose them. We don't risk losing them or risk uh, 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 you know, losing God's assets, as it were, when we're following God's leading, when we're following it, regardless of that outcome. He manages all that. He's looking for our faithfulness and the posture of our heart. He's looking at the courage it actually took to follow him when it was hard to do that. So I I want to encourage us to see that in this last servant. This last servant is really the last bit, the last chunk that we'll talk about today. In, In Matthew 25, verse 24 to 30, it says, Then the servant with the one bag of silver came and said, Master, I knew you were a harsh man, harvesting crops you didn't plant and gathering crops you didn't cultivate. I was afraid I would lose all your money, so I hid it in the earth. Look, here is your money back. But the master replied, you wicked and lazy servant. That is the opposite of good and faithful, in case you were wondering. If you knew I harvested crops and I didn't plant. In other words, if you really thought that I was this way, harvesting crops that I didn't plant, gathering crops that I didn't cultivate, why didn't you at least deposit my money in the bank? At least I could have gotten some interest on it. Then he ordered, take the money from this servant, give it to the one with ten bags of silver. To those who use well what they are given, even more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who do nothing, even what little they have will be taken away. Now throw this useless servant into outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now uh, Jesus had a particular point to make with the people that were listening that day. We can talk a little bit more about that. Um, But on the surface, doesn't it seem that the master was a little harsh with his servant? It probably does. To the rebellious person. <laughs> Some of us are like, yeah, I, well, I'm, I'm not rebellious. It probably does. To the rebellious person, it seems like, yep, exactly. Exactly like he said, master, master was harsh. No, I want you to read it again. And I, I, the real issue that the, servant, the last servant had wasn't just that he didn't accomplish anything. It wasn't like the master said, you accomplished nothing with this money. The real issue uh, is, is, is a matter of his heart. Look what lies he was believing. I want to read that again, and I want you to notice his heart's posture and his attitude toward the master. Then the servant with one bag of silver came and said, Master, I knew, so there's what he believes about the master. I knew you were a harsh man. And then look at verse 25. Just look at the first few words of verse 25. And so I was afraid. The way you believe about God determines the way you steward the resources he's given you. He says, I knew you were a harsh man, verse 24. I knew you were harsh. I believed wrongly about you. I believed wrongly about how you operate. The way he saw it was that I do all the work and you just get all the benefits. Any of us operating like that? 
I give, 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 and you just take, take, take. Maybe we think God's a harsh master. Maybe we think that he's being harsh to us by letting us go through some of the things we're going through in life. And that feels harsh at times. Maybe we feel like he's being harsh because he's keeping good things away from me. I'm afraid. You know, I think sometimes we're afraid. The way we see him leads us to be afraid of him. I'm afraid because I think you're going to ask me to do something I don't want to do. You're going to be harsh and make me do it. Or I'm afraid of you because you're going to ask me to give up something that I love. And so because I feel like you're kind of harsh like that, I, I'm afraid you're going to do that to me. And so then we hold back on faithfulness because of, of, of our perception of him. So not only did, did he have the wrong view of him, thought he was harsh, but he, had, he, he actually responded the wrong way because of how he viewed. He said, I, I was afraid, verse 25. I was afraid. I operated out of fear. I was afraid I would lose your money. I operated out of scarcity. I didn't have that much. I was afraid of you. I was afraid of what you would do. I was afraid to take risks. I was afraid not to work because I, I, did, I, I, I did work hard digging a hole to hide your money, but I was unwilling and afraid to do anything with what you'd given me, so I squandered all of my opportunities. I hid all my undeveloped talent, and I thought so poorly of you, and as a result, so poorly of me, that I did nothing to make a strong effort except in the other direction. This guy has some real heart issues, doesn't he? Poor fella. I'm glad I'm nothing like him. <laughs> Guys, I want to lead us as a church to a place of repentance. So that we say we don't want to be wicked and lazy servants. And that's not measured on the basis of what we've accomplished. It's measure, measured on the basis of our faithfulness to him. It's what we believe about him. And, and, and the last thing the servant says in verse 25 really just gives everything away, doesn't it? Can, can we read verse 25 again? Verse 25 says, I was afraid I would lose your money, so I hid it in the earth. Now look at this last phrase here. Look, here is your money back. Here's your money back. Take what belongs to you, but notice what he does not consider to belong to the master. Himself. The master's servant doesn't perceive himself to belong to the master. At the core of being a good and faithful servant is really how you perceive God and how you perceive yourself in relation to him. And faithfulness just flows out of that if it's right. The master's servant doesn't recognize that he belongs to the master. What it shows really is that his heart never belonged to the master in the first place. When our hearts belong to the master in fidelity, in, in loyalty to him, when we believe the best things and the right things and the true things about our master, our God, our, our Lord, our Father, then we're not going to react or fear, uh, react in fear towards him as the wicked and lazy servant did, but we'll respond or we'll act in bold faith as good and faithful servants who really do believe that God is good and faithful. And I think that's really at the core of this story. Whether or not, not whether or not we are good and faithful, but whether or not we actually believe God is good and faithful. The good and faithful servants are that way because they truly believe God to be good and faithful to them. And the wicked and lazy servant <laughs> is truly that way because he in some way is failing to see that God is good or that he is faithful. I think, I think if we're struggling, and at times I have struggled, and I do struggle, so I don't want to make this sound like, you know, I'm the one preaching to a bunch of people who have troubles. I have troubles, and I have struggles, and a lot of times when I'm struggling, it's likely for me that at the core of my struggle is that I'm, I'm really struggling to believe that God is good and that he's going to do good things for me or just be good to me. And I'm struggling to believe if he's faithful if he's really going to come through or really help me. I'm just struggling to believe that he's good and faithful. And, and what I want you to see today, I, I'm way over my time here, but I'm just going to show a series of verses, and I just want them, you to read over them. I want you to memorize them. Maybe you're here and you're taking notes, and I just, I, maybe this would be a great week to just memorize these verses. God is anything but harsh. His judgment at the end will come to all of those. It's, like, it's almost like a, um, 
It's almost like the, uh, projected reality. It's like they, they're going to get what they thought of him anyway. So the master was harsh towards him, but not because he's harsh, but because his heart was never really truly his in the first place. But in terms of his disposition towards us, it's anything but harsh. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 to 30. Then Jesus said, come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. What's he saying? Come to me. Come to me if you're heavy. Come to me if you're burdened. Come to me. I'm going to give you rest. I'm not going to berate you. I'm not going to be harsh to you. Come to me. And I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you. I want to teach you. Let me teach you. Because I'm humble. And I'm gentle at heart. And with me, you're going to find rest for your soul. My yoke is easy to bear. It's not heavy. It's not burdensome. You've misunderstood this whole thing. My yoke is easy to bear. And the burden I'm giving you is light. Romans 2, 4 says, Don't you see how wonderfully kind and tolerant and patient God is with you? Does this mean nothing to you? I mean, can't you see that his kindness is intended to turn you from your sin? I think we may need to make some declarations as a church that would just help to shape our faith that we believe God is generous. We believe that he's always working on things behind the scenes. We believe that he has not and he will not abandon us. We believe that we belong to him and we are opening our hearts to trust him. We are becoming endeared to him to the point that we would risk everything to follow him. We would lose everything to follow him if he were leading us in that direction. When we believe rightly about the master, we start to believe rightly about the things that the master, that belong to the master, especially ourselves. And, of course, the gifts that he's given us. And when we believe rightly about the master, rightly about what he's calling us to do, then that produces, that produces ownership. It produces initiative. It produces risk. It produces strategy. It produces excellence. When you go all in and follow God, your life doesn't get worse. Things don't get dis, more disorganized. Things don't get more dull and boring and, and uh, all of those other things that you might think. No, things get organized. Things get better. You don't get less productive. You get more productive. You don't achieve less. You achieve more. It's, it's all the way you wouldn't think it is. And isn't that the way it is anyways? And that's what we're saying here when we go all in and believe the best things about him. You and I can settle for less. Or we can give our lives to God and see him do amazing things through faithfulness to him. I want to pray. As I pray, I want you to just bow your heads. I want to read a few more verses. Because I think some of us really are afraid. And if you're operating in fear, rather than just starting there and telling yourself to stop doing that, I want you to realize that you're operating out of fear because of something you wrongly believe about God. So the question is, well, what if I sin? What if I make a mistake? Listen to faithfulness here. 1 John 1, 9. But if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful. And just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all wickedness. But what if it's not sin? What if I just am struggling to believe or just tired? What if I just want to give up? What if I want to quit? 2 Timothy 2, 13. Even if we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. God will help us. Listen to these words as God helps us. Philippians 2.13 God is working in you, giving you the desire and power to do what pleases Him. Philippians 1.6 And I'm certain that God who began the good work within you will be faithful to complete it. He will continue His work until it is finally finished on the day when Jesus Christ returns. Truly, truly, God is good and faithful. And He's making us good and faithful. Let's pray.